Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, Texas fly tire Barry Webster is going to teach us about the casual dress and the burrowing mayfly. I'm not familiar with the burrowing mayfly, but the casual dress is a personal favorite. Now, the weekly tip will be our last tip regarding hackle. Well, maybe. I might come back with something you never know, and we'll have a hackle summary. But welcome. We're the BDs from Boise. I'm Al. I'm Gretchen. And we're ready to turn this over to Barry. Barry Webster lives in Farmer's Branch, Texas, with his wife, Teresa. He has two grown daughters and a granddaughter, who is his best fly tying and fishing buddy, along with his golden retriever, Wally. He's retired from technical sales for the IBM Corporation. As a licensed professional engineer in Texas, he worked for a consulting engineering firm in Houston called Lockwood Andrews and Newman. He's active in fly fishing via the Fort Worth Fly Fishers. He's a tying director there. As a board member of the Dallas Fly Fishers, a board member for the FFF Texas Council, and in his spare time, he's on the board of directors for Fly Fishers International. He is a well-recognized demonstrator, fly tire with uh, presentations at regional and national levels. Barry is also a member of the Roadkill Roundtable, a group in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that has been tying together since the early 70s. Join us in welcoming him to Fly Tying Friday, and Barry, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Al. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm tying a couple of flies tonight that uh, I uh, uh, found in books that I own. Uh, one of them is an oldie but goodie uh, from uh, Polly Roseboro. And the other one is from a fairly new book within the last six months from Barry Ward Clark. In 1965, he published, uh, and inter interestingly enough, he self-published his uh, the first volume of this. It's called uh, Fishing and Tying the Fuzzy Nymph. Um, there are four editions of it. I mentioned the first one was in 1965. Um, in 1969, Orvis picked it up and uh, had an edition that came out. And then there were additional editions in 78 and in um, uh, 88. Um, Mr. Roseboro was also a Busick Award winner. And I believe he won the Busick Award in 1975 from uh, what was then, I, I, I guess it was the FFF probably at that time. Um, and uh, was uh, one of a long line of very uh, esteemed fly tires in there. Passed away in like 1997, but I've got a couple of versions. Um, that's backwards, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I reverse the mirror. But I've got a couple of versions of that book. And the casual dress is one of about 18 flies in there. Uh, there's another fly in there that I like a lot called uh, the Fleeter Mouse, which is also a very nice pattern. Um, the name Casual Dress comes from Mr. Roseboro said that he created the name for it because he didn't believe there could be anything that was more casually dressed than the casual dress. Uh, it's only got two elements in it. It's got muskrat and ostrich hurl. I've done a little uh, playing around with different things. I've tied it, same technique that I'm going to show. I've tied it out of Australian possum, um, tied it out of red fox. But the traditional dressing on this is uh, out of muskrat. And one of the reasons that I love the uh, casual dress is what happens to it when it gets wet. And I just happen to have one that I dunked in the water. And you can see the profile on that changes down. And to me, it is the best minnow imitation that I've ever seen. And the muskrat is so soft that it just kind of pulses in the water. Um, I get my muskrat in full uh, case skinned, and I use primarily the back because it's got 
very, very nice uh, guard hairs, super under fur, and I wind up getting um, the belly left over. And I use it a lot and just make muskrat dubbing that I mix with all kinds of things because it, uh, it dubs about as well as any uh, natural material I've seen. Uh, you can see that it's uh, traditionally tied on a 2X or 3X cell fly. Um, I tie it in like sizes two to probably really down to about a 16. And it gives you a very, very nice variation as long as you watch your uh, proportions on it. So I can simulate minnows from very, very small minnows up to pretty good size ones that our largemouth bass are uh, particularly fond of. Uh, I'm tying this tonight on a uh, 2XL streamer uh, size eight. So to start off, I'll put some uh, lead wraps on there. So I've got probably uh, 10 wraps or so on there and try to position it kind of in the middle of the shank so that as this is in the water column, it doesn't do a head dive or a tail dive, just kind of sinks straight down. Put a little uh, jam in front of that lead to hold it in place, come around behind it, put some wraps over the top of it, and then clip off the tag end of that. Now, to create the tail, and you can see I've got a patch of uh, well-used muskrat down here. To create the tail, I'm just going to grab a clump of that and kind of separate it out. And I've got the under fur, the guard hair, everything. I'm going to take my scissors down and clip that as close to the skin as I can. And you can see I've just got a clump of it. I'm going to take my fingers and separate out some of that under fur. And you don't throw that away because you save that and that becomes the, uh, the uh, body dub material at a later point. So I'm going to gather that clump, tie that in try to keep it on top of the hook shank. I'm just going to double body and I've pre-made a whole bunch of the uh, under fur. And I added actually a little uh, rainbow scud dub to it as you would start your wraps and you want to go all the way back to where the tail was. All right. Um, so I'm going to create a dub body on there and I'm trying to create a slightly tapered dub body going up to there. You'll notice I've left quite a bit of room at the front because the collar that I'm gonna create does take some space um, in there. CDC Swiss clamps. And I love the fact that they have a pointed nose on this and it allows me to get into the fur, select a small amount of it clip it loose and then insert it into the split dubbing loop. So I'm going to use the pointed end of this and insert it into the fur. You can see I've just grabbed the clump in there. I'm going to take my scissors and cut that very close to the thread and then do a little bit of manipulation on that fur to kind of spread it out, give me a nice even set of it and give me a little bit outside the clump. Uh, Stofno makes a cute little attachment for splitting thread. Um, if the thread is nicely flattened out, I usually just do it with my bodkin, but this works by placing the thread up in there, pushing on it and it, as you can see, does a nice job of splitting the thread in there. Then I take that Swiss CDC loop, put it inside that split loop, pull the thread over so it's just to the edge of that, 
and undo my clamp. And you can see I have that down in the loop. I then take my trusty whip finish tool, all that muskrat fur, and creates a very nice um, dubbing brush. I'm gonna take and wrap that on at the point where my abdomen stopped. I'm gonna use my fingers to preen that material back and keep preening it back as I wrap the collar around. And once I've got it all in there, I'm just going to use kind of a thread dam back against that to hold the collar back. And you can see that creates a very, very nice collar segment that have very, very long barbules on it and are kind of real fluffy. And those are typically not what you want for your classic Atlantic salmon flies but um, stick those back in your tying materials because this is one of those places where the bigger, the fluffier it is, the better it is. So I'm gonna select one of those ostrich hurls, clip it off. And I always take and use my fingernails to kind of strip that off and get down to a bare rachis. And I'm going to tie that in. And one of the things you want to make sure you're doing as you create this is your segment up here at the front where you're going to apply the ostrich. You want to make sure that that is as level as possible with your thread base, because if you have a very drastic slope, or if you have um, a lot of uh, steps in there, then you're going to struggle with your tying in your ostrich hurl on a classic Atlantic salmon fly building that ostrich hurl section. Doesn't have to be real big, but this adds a very nice color change. And I think. Um, imitates the head of the minnow in the pattern. So I'll clip off. So I'm going to throw a quick whip finish on there. Go ahead and clip my thread off. And I always throw a little Sally Hansen's on this just to toughen it up a bit. And I think it also gives a nice glossy head to it. And invariably, I fill up the eye with head cement. So I always take my bodkin and clean that out a bit. But as you can see, that's a very, very quick eye. A fur company, I believe they're up in Minnesota or Michigan, I'm not sure which. It's called Glacier Wear. And Glacier Wear has the muskrat pelts. I think the last ones I ordered, and they, they have several grades of it. Um, I select the lowest grade that they have because I'm going to chop it up anyway. But I pay, think I paid $13.95 for a full pelt. Again, when that gets wet, that's what it turns into. And in the water, if you have a chance to look at that, that muskrat is so soft that it literally just sits there and undulates in the water. It looks like it's alive. Okay, no questions? Then I will move on to the next fly. All right, the next fly that I'm going to tie, um, so we were talking about a, a 1965 uh, first edition book. Uh, this is in, I think that's, I've got my 
camera unmirrored. Sorry about that. But it's Barry Ord Clark's The Feather Benders Fly Tying Techniques. So we're going to tie the uh, burrowing uh, mayfly nymph from Barry Ord Clark. <clears throat> All right, and I, I will warn you ahead of time, if you go to Barry Ord Clark's book, you'll find that I do this a little bit different. Um, I've kind of ad adapted it. His body is a dubbed body, and I'm going to use a rubber legs material for the body. Um, other than that, it's pretty much the same as what he's done. So I'm going to start the thread on there. And the first thing I'm going to tie in is the tail. And what I'm using, um, this is just a hairline. It's an olive uh, ostrich hurl. And if you look at the way these things work out, there's all kinds of little bitty short um, barbs down at the bottom and they're they're too short to tie you know collars and things like that but guess what they work just perfect for the tails on these so i've selected three of the shorter peacock um, barbs and try to make sure those are matched up in length close as possible. And I'm going to have a tail on here. And I'm just going to wrap that down the body ways and then clip off the tag ends. Next, I'm going to take a longer ostrich hurl and tie it in. That's going to become my ribbing material. And I'm going to tie in a piece of um, legging material. And you could use any kind of legging material that you wanted. Uh, I am using um, Fly Tires Dungeon Bug Legs in Olive. Okay, so I have the long piece of ostrich hurl tied in. I'm gonna tie in the piece of bug legs. And once I get those in there, I'm gonna build up a tapered body. Okay, that's probably good enough. And so now I'm gonna take the legging material and I'm going to start wrapping that right back where the tails join in. And I'm going to try to do nicely touching adjacent wraps. And I've left a taper in there that I wished I hadn't, but it will work because we're going to cover up a lot of this with another material in a moment. Okay. So I'm just gonna tie that off. And clip off the tag into that. Now I'm gonna grab my long piece of ostrich and I'm gonna to begin to wrap that. It's actually seating itself down in there amongst that leg material. And so sometimes you kind of have to force it to go where you want it to go. And we'll go ahead and tie that off. And clip off the tag into that. I'm going to do a couple of things at this point. I'm going to give this a little haircut on the back. Typically, the nymph is smooth. On the back, it doesn't have all that stuff kind of growing out the top side. And so I'm just going to give it a little haircut. And so I'm going to take some of my UV cure. And I'm just going to run a slight bead down the back. Turn that up. 
All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is create a, um, a wing case. But I have a segment of that already pulled out that I'm going to use. So I'm going to take a bit of this. And I'm going to, now in here, this white, I don't really want it to show. And just give that a quick swipe so that it buries it. And I'm going to tie them in. Flip off the tag ends. You could also switch to another thread at this point so you didn't have to mess with coloring it. Um, and so I'm going to take that peacock curl, tie that off, clip the tag ends. And at this point, I'm going to do some things to this, but I don't want it to be white thread. I have a couple of nice bushy CDCs that I've selected. And I'm going to go back to my handy dandy Swiss CDC tool. And I'm going to come in. And I've grabbed those two CDC fibers. I've got the rachises of the two feathers outside of the CDC, or excuse me, outside of the Swiss clamp. And I'm going to come in here with my scissors. And I'm just going to clean off, clip off those stems. Okay. So. I'm left with a bunch of that CDC fiber in my uh, Swiss CDC clamp. I'm going to stick my bodkin through it and open up a loop. You can see I've got my finger in there holding that open. I'm going to stick the clamp in there. And now I've got all those fibers inside that split thread. I'm going to do the same thing that I did on the casual dress. I'm going to come in and spin my thread up. Whip finish tool loose. I've now got a really nice dubbing brush. And I'm going to carefully wind that back through that peacock curl. And I'm just going to use my fingers again to prune that stuff to the back as I wrap some turns through there. Okay, now I've got that CDC is kind of going everywhere. I'm going to use my fingers to push it either one side or the other. So I've kind of created a flat spot on top. I'm going to take the synthetic material here, easily take my thread over the top of it. I'm going to put one loop in front, come over, clip off the tag end. And just to give myself a little more room, I'm going to Create a little bit longer piece of green thread. And then I'm going to take my whip finish tool and do about a five turn whip finish right behind the eye. Give it a quick haircut. But there's the finished fly. Now, this piece of paper has all of the flies. This is the how, these were all tied by Polly Roseboro. Wow. And when he was 
uh, you know, trying to make business for himself, he would take this sheet of paper and he would take these around and hand them out to, to uh, dealers. And this is one from 1979. And here is the way he did the casual dress back then. Notice no tail. And there's no, uh, although the, the recipe in his book calls for ostrich, there's no ostrich on this one. <laughs> so, so he took some liberty with his uh, recipe as well. Weekly tip. Um, we were going to talk about hackle and uh, possibly the last offering, if you will, though there we probably have slipped over quite a few. The one we're going to talk about tonight, though, will be uh, the hackle stacker. And as you can see, I've got a bunch of materials over here. And one of them is this huge spool of thread that I stole from Gretchen's embroidery machine because there's lots of this thread. It's just the right size and strength. And uh, as you can see, I've got a lot of it. It's a, it's a little over a thousand yards. In case you're wondering to know what size it is, it's T45. Obviously not in any of the deniers that we worry about in fly tying. You can also use monofilament for what we're gonna, gonna do, or as you can see, you can use Antron body wool or a whole bunch of different things. Hooks, thread, I'll just set that thread right over there with the vise. And I've got two colors of, um, of, of hackle. You can use whatever you want. One of the things we wanna talk about though is the size of hackle. I'm gonna be tying in a size 10 right now. But anyway, back of the vise, you can see that I've, um, just put, put down some threads so that we can show you this particular technique. And here's a piece of that heavy cord from that T45 cord from Gretchen's embroidery spool. Spool is kind of a, isn't it interesting that when we think of spool, we think of a spool that looks kind of like this. And um, that thousand yard spool is also a spool. So anyway, matter of perspective. Anyway, I'll get this right into there and anchored into place. Now, before I go any further, I wanna go into a screen share and talk to you about something for a moment. We're looking at a, a, just a big blow up of a hook. Well, the way we're gonna tie this particular fly, normally a normal sized tackle would start with the measurement here from the hook shank. And you would say the fiber should be equal to the gap and a half or a gap and a little more, whatever it is. Well, we wanna have a properly proportioned hackle, but we're gonna be attaching hackle to a thread or a fiber that goes across like that. The hackle will be wrapped around it and it will start from there. And we want it to come down to that length. So the length that we're gonna need will be a hackle that at least is at least one time larger or even two sizes larger depending on uh, the, uh, the sizing of your hackle. And there's always a little bit of variance in from one to the next. But let me get rid of these. And that's why we're going to, even though we're using a size number 10 tonight, I'm using a number, a large number eight. And when I say a large number eight, you know that we're talking about that variance in hackle size. Now I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna grab one of my brown hackles here. I got a really long one here. I'll just grab it. Now, one of the things I'll tell you guys straight up front, even though I think this is probably the coolest one of the of the hackle footprints that we're going to, we've talked about in the last weeks, it's not one I use very much. And why is that? I hate tying the darn thing. I'm not worth a darn edit. Tell you that right up front. But before we go any further, I need to talk to you about the gallows. And this is a gallows tool. As you can see. This end goes on the vice stem, and then this hangs up above. The one you see right here is anchored into the parachute post, or if you're going to do an extended body, this one pulls down to the extended body. But that's what those are for. But let's tie on that hackle. And here's where you can get into trouble. Even though I don't like tying this thing, I've tied enough of the darn things commercially to have a couple of tips for you. 
if you just take and tie this thing on the hook, I want you to notice, see how that feather turned is thread torque allowed that to twist away. In fact, I've had to turn my vise way over so you could see that. Let me stop because what's going to happen when I start to wrap that around the thread, it's going to flip over and the dull side is going to show up. And I want the sunny side to, sh sunny side to be up. It's the shiny side facing me now. Now, uh, I'll take a couple turns to anchor it. Now, let me pull this up like I was going to start to wrap it. And if it's going to flip over, I would be able to see that. And I'd stop right there and it wouldn't go any further. Let me go ahead and anchor that in place. It looks to me like it's going to react the way I want it to. I'll trim off the waist stem here. OK, and I'm going to pull my thread up into the gallows tool or the, the um, tool for the parachute. And I'm going to start by wrapping up the temporary post that we've made out of the thread, working my way up until I think I have gone far enough up that the distance here that I'm showing with my scissor points is equal to the distance that I want to span right here in the front. So let me just keep going. Okay, now I'm going to stop a couple of turns right there at the top, tight together, and I'm going to start working my way back down. Now I've pulled that over. I've done at the bottom of the post. I pull that over. I, I anchor my, grab my thread, and I make sure that it just barely eases up over that hook, and it goes, and I pull it back like that, and that'll that ties off my feather. Bring it down, up and over the shank, and then straight down and pull it back. I'll do that again. I'm wanting to, I'm trying to protect these fibers right here so I don't capture them when I don't want to. Now I'll get my gallows tool out of the way. Just pull that back. You see now it's loose and free, which will allow me to pull this back and capture that. And I'll just pull this around so I can see what I'm doing. All right, now I'm gonna just wrap forward. Now, typically what you would do is this would be one of the middle steps in the construction of a fly. I'm not gonna put any dubbing and tail on the back. I'm not putting any on the front. I'm showing you a hackle application that you take and do with as you, as you please. I'll show you a couple more ways to put it on the hook other than the one I'm using right now. But anyway, I'll pull this up and I'm gonna tilt this towards you so maybe you can see a little bit better what I'm doing. There we go. Now you're looking right straight at the front of that wrap tackle right there where my scissor point is. And I'm just kind of pulling these apart, separating them slightly. Now, I'll uh, pull this forward. And one of the things you don't want to get crazy about in this, I've learned over the years, is anchor this first in front. Now pull back on the bobbin like I am right back here, back and pull forward on the post, if you will, which is just a piece of thread. Now here is where I wanna dog leg this back just like we do with a hackle and wrap a thread head. Set that aside, get my whip finish tool out, and apply a whip finish. Now let's just take a look here and let you all see what kind of a footprint we've got. The footprint, except for a, a screwed up one right there that I'll trim off, the footprint is too not dissimilar to the Biford one that we did several weeks ago. Quite frankly, I like the Biford one a lot. And let's, let's set that aside for a minute. And let's go back over to the materials for a second, Gretch. <clears throat> I want you to notice that I've got some six pound monofilament sitting here, and it could be whatever pound I want. 
The reason I'm not using that is not that it won't do a really great job on the parachute post. The problem is, is it's so stiff that dog legging it back to make a nice smooth head doesn't work and you end up with this stub of monofilament sticking up. So I'm not using that, but that's, but that's the only reason. But what, what I am going to do instead is I'm going to use some uh, Antron yarn. Just cut off a chunk of that. And we'll go back over to the vise. <clears throat> I'm going to show you another way to use this material or this concept, if you will, this type of, of hackling. Do the same thing as I did before, making certain that the shiny side is facing the facing me and the camera. Now I pull that over; it lays fine, and sometimes they'll still flip over. And uh, if that happens, then you want to reposition so it doesn't flip over, unless you specifically want the dull side facing up, which would then be facing to the front of the hook. Now I'm going to pull this up and anchor it in my clip. And just start wrapping around it no different than we did before except obviously it's a different material it's also a lot sturdier material obviously than that much smaller thread and so it's a lot easier to wrap around that you can probably even see i'm getting a denser application in my wrapped hackle let me work my way back down to the starting point All right, I'll tie off that feather. And again, I'll come around over the hook and back down again and again. Now I'm just going to release that just like I did before. Twist my, my vise around so that I can trim off that feather. Wrap forward. But I don't want to go quite all the way back to the hook eye this time. Let me turn this around so you can see that I'm going to do just like I did before. I'm going to kind of divide that. Pull it out to the sides. Now we'll bring this over. Capture it in our thread. Hold the bobbin back. Pull the material down. Now, here we're at a, at a point we can do something different. We can take and cut this off just right here as if it were like a, a clipped head like you would on a, on a elk hair caddis. I think you can all envision that. If I were just to come in like this and go clip, it would be done. I'm not going to do that. The other thing you can do is you can pull it back. Got some hackle that I should have cut off and I didn't. Okay, and you can just dog leg this right here with a jam knot and kick it back so that it becomes like a like a wing sticking back here and you can trim it up here. Or let me unwind this and I'll show you the one, one last option you can do with this particular. All right, there, there we go. And now what I'm going to do is just take my bodkin, lay this over and make myself a little little bubble head there. And that may be to your liking. Those are all different options that you can do for that. And then you can trim that off as a long wing, as a short wing, as a no wing, just a bubble head. Those are all things that are up to you. I'm just going to whip finish it off and leave my options there. Okay. But there we have the the hackle footprint that we talked about. And I had a, a snag feather right there. So that brings it out more to the sides. Let me tilt that, there you go. You can better see the footprint that we get out of, out of that type of a hackle. Let's compare that now to several weeks back, we did the, what I called the Frank Johnson water, water walker, which was parachutes around each post. It gives you, a platform like that 
Now, I was told by several people in emails that Frank Johnson did not invent that. Somebody else did back in the 70s. You couldn't prove it by me. All I can tell you is Frank Johnson showed this to me. The next week, we took the same concept, only we did crisscross wraps between one hackle, crisscrossing between the wings, giving us a hackle footprint on the water like that. The week after that, we went in the first of the Biford tie. And the Biford tie is, if you'll recall, is where you just wrap a regular hackle. And then the last application of dubbing is a crisscross under the hackle, through the hackle to divide it so that you get a hackle uh, footprint that's similar to that. And the week after that, <clears throat> We did our variation of the Biford, and it's the one we prefer over and above the regular hackle. And that's where we just took a strip of material, in this case, yarn, but it could have been a peacock, ostrich, or whatever the heck you want to put in there to give you a hackle footprint that looks like that. We think that's the best optional hackle footprint, if you will. However, the, the one that's, I would say, 80% of the flies in our Personal fly boxes, they got traditional hackle on them. Truth of the matter is here in the West, you're fishing some pretty rough water. And uh, in, in fishing that kind of water, I don't think the fish have a ch chance to see what the footprint looks like. That said, 20% have the modified Biford in our, in our fly box. And that's for spring creeks. And spring creek is a totally different ball game than fishing some uh, rushing mountain stream or freestone river. Like even like the, it's something as big as the Yellowstone. A lot of a lot of rough water in the Yellowstone. And then on the flip side, there's a lot of side channels in the Yellowstone that fish just like a spring creek. <clears throat>